Okay, this is chapter 10. It deals with the muscle tissue. Just kind of an overview of the different types of muscles. There's three different types. We have skeletal muscle, which does respond to neural stimulation. There's cardiac muscle that will respond to internal stimulation, and hormones can have some effect on it. And then smooth muscles, the third kind, this responds to hormones and also to local stimulation like stretching. When we look at the histology or under the microscope at the tissues, skeletal muscle tissue is going to be striated. It is multinucleated. There's usually no branching. The, the muscle cells are typically are very long, but they are arranged in such a way it looks as though they're lined up uh, parallel. So there's no branching with it. And remember, skeletal muscle is under voluntary control. You can decide whether you're moving your arm or not. Cardiac muscle is found only in the heart. When you look at it under the microscope, it also is going to be striated. It only has a single nucleus per cell. So that's one way you can distinguish it from the skeletal. It is under involuntary control. There's also branch, a lot of branching with the cell, so that is another thing that you can use to distinguish it from skeletal muscle. When it contracts, it will contract as a single unit, so all the cells together contract as a single unit, and this is possible because of the intercalated disc, which are these connections between adjacent uh, muscle cells. Intercalated discs are found only in cardiac muscle. So that's another thing. There's several things, obviously, you can look at to distinguish, uh, histologically speaking, a skeletal muscle from cardiac muscle. And then smooth muscle is not striated, so that's the easiest one. Just There's no stripes on it. It's smooth muscle. It also has a single nucleus. It is also under involuntary control. It tends to be more spindle-shaped. So thicker in the middle and tapers on either end. Smooth muscle is going to be found uh, in most of your internal organs. So when we look at um, the a slide of it, example, then you can see up here. Let's see if we can. I'm trying to get this where we can see it a little bit better. Uh, on the top is the skeletal muscle, and so you can see there are some uh, striations or looks like striping patterns. You can certainly see there's no branching, but the cells are lined up parallel to each other with multiple, these are nuclei in there. The smooth muscle, there's no uh, striations whatsoever. And then the cardiac muscle, you tend to have branching, like right here, some branching. Uh, if you're to enlarged as you'd be able to see a little bit better. You can see there's kind of a line across here. That's an intercalated disc. They will look like lines that stretch across the width of the cell. So what are some characteristics of muscles? Excitability. That means that you can send this electrical impulse or electrical wave that we call action potential along the membrane. Elasticity means that after you stretch it, it will return back to its original length. Extensibility means it will stretch. Contractility means it can also shorten in length. So obviously there's a lot of movement associated with muscles. This chapter is going to fo focus mostly on skeletal muscle, so we're going to look at that first, and then later we will look at cardiac and smooth muscle. So some of the functions of skeletal muscles, it helps to provide movement. Uh, the muscles typically are attached to the skeleton, and so when the muscle contracts, it's going to move those bones, and you see it as movement. It helps to maintain your posture. It helps to maintain that skeletal stability. Muscles tend to pass over joints and help to stabilize those joints. If you've ever had any problems or injuries to your joints, you're aware of this. Um, I've had injuries to my knees in one of the things they will do in rehab to try to strengthen the knee after surgery is to have you go through rehab to help strengthen the muscles around the joint to help make it more stable. Muscles are also going to help control certain movements along your internal tracts, such as swallowing. 
It's, they help to protect internal organs. They also help to support a lot of the internal organs. And as muscles contract, that movement, it generates heat. And that's uh, one factor involved with helping to maintain your internal body temperature. In terms of some of the organization of skeletal muscle, this is where you'll notice that we tend to rename some uh, different features of the cell that you're familiar with. The muscle cell, we will call a muscle fiber. So whenever you see muscle fiber, just say, okay, that's an individual cell. There are different layers of connective tissue uh, membrane covering the muscle. The thin connective tissue layer that's going to surround an individual muscle fiber, so around the individual muscle cell, is called the endomycin. When you take several of those muscle fibers and you group them into a bundle, that's called a fascicle. Around that fascicle or around that bundle of muscle fibers, you're going to have another layer of connective tissue, like another membrane holding that bundle together. That's called the paramycin. And then epimycin is around where you have a whole group of the fascicles together, making up the entire muscle. And that's going to help separate the muscle from many of the surrounding tissues. So when we look at this diagram here, Dan, we're going to start at the bottom. We're, we're kind of looking at the picture in reverse order as shown here. Myofibril. This is an individual um, set of myofilaments that are inside a muscle cell. And you can see here some mitochondria. This is what's going to be involved with the um, muscle contraction itself. So you literally will have thousands of those in a cell. So this is an individual down here on the bottom, an individual uh, muscle cell, or as we said, a muscle fiber. It's skeletal muscle, so you can see there's multiple nucleus in it. This is wrapped. So here's your muscle fiber. It is going to be wrapped around the sarcolemma is, in a moment, you're going to find that's the same thing as the plasma membrane. That's, remember, surrounding the cell. Now, surrounding that, like a little sweater on top of that, if you will, is going to be the endomyosin. And that's what they're pointing out here. So here's one muscle cell. That's the contractile feature, functional unit in it. So here is... Now, one muscle fiber around each one of these individual muscle fibers here will be the endomycin. You take several of these fibers, as you see, packaged here together in a bundle. So several of them form a bundle. And it's too easy for us to call it a bundle. So instead, we're going to call it a muscle fascicle. And that fascicle is going to be surrounded or wrapped, if you will, with the paramotion. Now you take several of these fascicles, several of these bundles, and you put them together to form the entire muscle, and you're going to wrap that with the epi. So think of it as the endo is going to be the innermost, the epi, the peris, the midi, middle, and the epi is the outermost. And here comes some of the renaming of things. The sarcolemma, that is a term that is specific for referring to the plasma membrane of a muscle fiber or muscle cell. The sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR, is a form of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. It is specialized in the muscle fiber so that it's able to store calcium. And then the sarcomere is <coughs> excuse me, the functional unit of the skeletal muscle fiber. The sarcomere is going to contain the actin, which is the 
layman's term, that's what we call the thin filament, the myosin, which is the same thing as your thick filament, and then some supporting uh, proteins, troponin and tropomyosin, that we'll see when we talk about the muscle contraction itself. <coughs> so once again, if you go back and you look at an individual muscle fiber as we have here, then what you're going to see, this is skeletal muscle, remember. I'd already previously pointed out, you've got nucleus here, you've got more than one per cell, so this is just one cell. You've got your mitochondria inside here, and you've got all these myofibrils, these myofilaments that are in there. Notice here on the surface, you're seeing those striations, that striping pattern that you, you see associated with skeletal muscle. You see it with cardiac as well. Well, this is going to explain why you have it. It all is going to boil down to the fact that you have these thick filaments, which is the myosin, and you have thin filaments, which is the actin. Now on this diagram, the thin filaments are the green lines on this lower diagram. And the thick filaments are kind of these dark purplish color lines, which are drawn thicker to show that they are indeed thicker in diameter. Why do you get the striations? Why do you get these light bands and then you have these dark bands in here? What happens is the way these thick filaments and thin filaments overlap. As you can see, there are some areas where you only have the thin filaments, and that's what we're going to call the I band, and it looks lighter. You have this section where you have some just the thick or myosin filaments, and then you've got areas on either side of that where you have overlapping thick and thin. That's going to appear darker and that's referred to as the A-band. So that's what you see up here on top as that, that darker A-band. Sarcomere, we just said that is the functional unit of the muscle. So what is that? That is this area that goes from halfway of a light band to halfway to the next light band, which the light bands are the eye. Think light has an eye in it. Dark has an A. The word dark has an A in it, so that's the A band. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to see from muscle contraction, you're going to have an interaction occurring between the thick and the thin filaments in this area of overlap. So that sarcomere is just that arrangement with the actin and the myosin, and then there's also the supporting proteins. Like I said, that's what's causing the striations. The supporting proteins, troponin and tropomyosin. Keep in mind that the actin is the thin filament, myosin is the thick filament. <coughs> this is just an enlarged picture of showing, once again, the sarcomere, the light band, the dark band, um, how they alternate, how you do have some overlapping areas between the light and the dark, or between your thick and thin filaments right there at the end. Your myosin, your thick filament, if you look at this diagram right over here on the left, you'll notice there's, there's actually multiple strands here, and you have what we call the heads. You have these um, little projections sticking out. The head portion, that is what is going to bind or connect to the actin, to the, the thin filament, which is shown over here on the right side. Where is it going to bind? It's going to bind on this darker green area right here. But there's a problem right now. At rest, that darker green area, which is the binding site, that's where this head has to bind, it's covered up. By what? This orange line is your tropomyosin. So typically what you have here is your actin. It's basically two strands that are twisted together. 
And the supporting proteins that we talk about is essentially you've got this long, the way it's color coded here, orange strand, which is the tropomyosin. Attached to it periodically are these little light beige colored balls. That is your troponin. Troponin is holding that tropomyosin in place. So here's your troponin right here, this beige ball. It is holding this orange line right over that darker green. If the binding site's covered up, then that means the myosin cannot bind to that site. It's kind of like you cannot stick a key in a keyhole if your, if your hand is covering up the keyhole. You're going to have to move your hand in order to put the keyhole, the key into the keyhole. You can stand there all you want, but if the keyhole's covered up, you're not putting the key in. You've got to move the hand and then put the key in. So at re this is a way of helping to um, kind of regulate contraction versus being at rest. At rest, that binding site's covered up. For muscle contraction to occur, you're going to have to move that orange line, which is the tropomyosin. How are you going to move the tropomyosin? How are you going to move that orange strand? Well, this little beige ball right here, that troponin, that's helping hold things in place. So you're going to have to move that. The neuromuscular junction, this is the area where the neuron meets the muscle fiber. They are very close to each other, but there's actually no physical touching between these two players, if you will. The nerve and the muscle, they come right up next to each other, but they do not physically touch each other. This is the only way that you can activate or stimulate a skeletal muscle fiber is by the neural stimulation. The nerve has to, to send an impulse to it. If it doesn't, the muscle is just going to sit there. So when we have up here in the very top picture, this is showing a neuron that's coming down and innervating. When we say it innervates something, that just means it's going, the nerve is going to stimulate something. So something, if it's innervated, it means it has a nerve that's going to stimulate it. And this nerve is coming down, it's going to innervate these, this muscle here. So if you enlarge this area where this kind of greenish color, that's the tip of the nerve. So that's the nerve down here, this kind of reddish color or whatever is on the bottom. This is the muscle. So the neuromuscular junction, that is this area right in here of where the neuron comes in, it's going to stimulate the muscle, but notice it doesn't actually touch it. It's enlarged even more so right here. It does not actually touch. There's a little bit of a space here. So this complex would be your neuromuscular junction. This space is called the synaptic cleft area, right? It's labeled right here, synaptic cleft. That's that area between, that space that's actually between the neuron and the muscle at the neuromuscular junction. So we're talking about excitation contraction coupling. What does this mean? What it means is that all cells have a resting potential or a membrane potential, depending which book they'll use either term interchangeably. What does that mean? It means that most cells are slightly negative on the inside of the cell and slightly positive on the outside of the cell. So it means the potential is like a charge. So you could say it has a resting charge or a membrane charge. What is that charge? It's slightly negative on the inside, slightly positive on the outside. Why is this so important? Because that's going to help regulate or control the movement of ions like calcium and sodium and potassium and determine if you open a gate, if you open a, a protein gate, an ion gate, it's kind of like if you open a door on the membrane, which way are those ions going to flow? Things want to flow from high concentration to low concentration. That's what diffusion is. And so 
having these charge differences on one side of the membrane versus the other, that's going to help control the movement across the membrane. When you change this membrane potential or you change this charge across the membrane, what are you going to do? You are actually going to be generating an electrical charge, which is an action potential. So you start to change the electrical charge is normally negative on the inside. What's going to happen is you're going to start changing it more positive on the inside. That is the generation ultimately of an action potential. And that action potential or that change in charge can be transmitted all down the length of the cell membrane. This is what the basis for generating a nerve impulse and for generating muscle contraction. It's all going to be based on at rest, the inside of the cell is negative, but you're going to change it to positive. You're going to change that electrical charge on the inside. Permanently? No. Just temporarily. Very quickly. And that's just enough to send that change of a charge down the membrane. So this is what we're going to see for skeletal muscle contraction, that the membrane is going to be what we call excited. You're going to generate an action potential. Okay, so you change the charge on the inside of the membrane. How does that lead to muscle contraction? In a very brief, basic summary, is that you're going to have a muscle the nerve that's associated with it has been stimulated by some other stimulus. You have an action potential. You have this electrical impulse that's coming down the nerve. It's going to come down, trigger a series of events. Ultimately, the muscle at the neuromuscular junction is going to trigger or create an action potential itself. Why it's going to change the charge from negative to positive. That it starts in a small area and then it's finally going to go through the entire length of the cell. That is an action potential. What does that, that action potential do? What does that electrical charge that's moving down the, the surface of the plasma membrane do? Well, remember in the sarcoplasma reticulum, the SR, that is that specialized smooth endoplasmic reticulum and muscle fibers. And I said that in there is where you store calcium. When this electrical charge comes down, it's going to release calcium into the sarcoplasm or into the cytoplasm. And then why is that important? Because calcium is the trigger for starting up the actual muscle contraction. You're going to have a whole series of steps setting everything up. That's the excitation part before you get to the contraction part. So it's like excitation is generating... Um, an electrical charge, which is the action potential. You're generating that so you can release the calcium because you have to have calcium released from the SR in order to now start the steps for contraction. Contraction cannot occur if calcium is not there. So how do you get the calcium out of storage, out of that SR? The way you get it out is by having that electrical impulse, that electrical charge, which is the action potential, come down and release the calcium. That's why the excitation and the contraction stages have to be coupled together. They have to be linked together. A neurotransmitter is simply a chemical that's going to be released from the neuron and it's going to stimulate what we're going to be looking at right now is that it stimulates the muscle at that neuromuscular junction. Just keep in mind that instead of a muscle, there could be a gland. It could be another neuron. What we're looking at right now in this example is going to be another, a muscle, a skeletal muscle. There are lots of different types of neurotransmitters. The most well-studied one is acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that's always going to be released at the neuromuscular junction to stimulate skeletal muscles. There are other neurotransmitters that are sometimes released that may stimulate 
another neuron or stimulate a gland. But if it's with skeletal muscle, it's always going to be acetylcholine. As you saw in a previous picture, the synaptic cleft is that space that's between the neuron and the muscle at that neuromuscular junction. Now, the synaptic cleft could also be the space that's between two neurons. If you have a neuron that stimulates another neuron, it, it's just that space that's between them. Depolarization. This is the term that we use to describe the process where essentially positive charge ions are going to be entering the cell. And remember that resting potential, how you normally have a negative charge inside the cell. So we can actually measure what that charge is. And it's usually on a resting cell around minus 70 millivolts. So it's a negative number because it's, it's negative inside. Depolarization is the process of where you're taking that resting potential and you're making that more positive. You're getting it closer to zero. So if you're normally at rest around minus 70 millivolts, if you were to change it to six, minus 60 millivolts, that's getting closer to zero. So that would be a depolarization. So once again, in this picture that you just saw a little bit ago, just to remind you, here is your neuron up here at the top. Here is your muscle. Your synaptic cleft is that space between the two at the neuromuscular junction. <coughs> You're going to have an action potential come down the neuron. It's going to trigger a series of events here and then ultimately start to generate an action potential in the muscle. So what are the steps of an action potential? Of the muscle contraction. In some of my more detailed classes like AMP1, I have this down to 27 steps. So there's a lot of steps. For this particular class, you don't need to know it quite as detailed, but it might help. Just kind of listen what's going to happen. You have an action potential that's traveling down the axon of the neuron. So you've had some event where you've had some stimulus, whatever it is, that has happened previously. This action potential is moving down the neuron, and it comes down and it reaches the end of the neuron, the end of that axon that we call the axon terminus. So it's going to come down. What is that action potential? It's, it's an electrical impulse. It's that positive charge. Remember, the cell's normally negative on the inside. This positive charge is coming down when it reaches the very end of the axon, that axon terminus. It is going to trigger the release of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is typically stored in these little vesicles at the axon terminus. Now, I don't have it here, but just so you know, if you're wondering how does it trigger, it's going to allow calcium to come into the axon terminus, and that's going to trigger the release then of this acetylcholine. When acetylcholine is released from the axon, it's at the axon terminus, so where does it go? Well, it's just naturally going to be dumped into the synaptic cleft. Things always want to go from high concentration to low concentration. So if you're dumping it all out on the axon terminus end, on the neural end, into the synaptic cleft, it's going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft. So it's moving towards the muscle. Now on the muscle, on the sarcolemma, on the plasma membrane, are receptors that are very specific that will bind acetylcholine. So the acetylcholine travels across the synaptic cleft, and it's going to bind to the receptors. When it binds to that receptor, when the acetylcholine binds to the receptor that's on the muscle, it causes an ion gate to open. And this ion gate is very specific for sodium. So it's like you just open the door and you are allowing sodium now 
which is normally very high outside the cell, low concentration inside the cell, so it's going to allow the sodium to, to enter the muscle fiber. Sodium has a plus charge. Inside the cell, it's negative. But you just open an ion gate, and you're letting all this plus charge come in. So now the inside of that muscle is starting to become a more positive charge. As this continues to flow in, you're getting more positive and more positive. Then you have some other gates, ion gates, that are voltage regulated ones. So normally the inside of the cell is negative where you're changing it positive. So it's able to detect this change in the charge, the voltage. So it's going to open. And what does it do? It allows even more sodium. So you've got all this sodium basically pouring into the muscle. All this positive charged sodium is making the inside more and more positive, which is depolarization. When the positive charges reach a certain level, there's what we call a threshold level. For skeletal muscles, it's around minus 55 millivolts. So remember at rest, you were minus 70. You got all this positive charge coming in. You reach about minus 55, and at that point, that's threshold. If you reach 55 millivolts and it's a negative 55, then boom, you generate an action potential. It's, it's kind of like an all or nothing. If you only get to minus 60, okay, well, you changed it a little bit, but nothing's going to happen. It's just in a small area that you changed it. If you reach that threshold point of around minus 55 millivolts, all or nothing, boom, you generate an action potential. It's, it's gone now. It's going to travel the entire length of the sarcolemma now. So that action potential is going down the sarcolemma. Now, with muscle fibers, you often have these indentations in the sarcolemma that extend down internally into the cell. And we call those indentations the T-tibules. On either side of the T-tibule is a structure that is referred to as the terminal cisternae. <coughs> so you have a terminal cisternae, you have a T-tibule, and then on the other side is another terminal cisternae. That complex of three items is known as the triad. And why is that so important? Well, guess what's stored in the terminal cisternae? That is part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that's where you're storing the calcium. So when that action potential, which remember, that's the, the positive electrical charge, when it comes down and it hits that terminal cisternae, it releases the calcium. Where does the calcium go? It goes into the sarcoplasm. Remember, that's the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. All of this is part of the excitation uh, stage. Well, great. So now you've released all this calcium. What is it going to do? Calcium binds to troponin. Remember, that is one of those supporting proteins. That was in that previous picture. It was like the little beige ball. Calcium binds to that. And what do I say happens every time you have something bind to another chemical? You're always going to have a shape change. And remember in that previous picture, the tropomyosin was that orange strand. It, well, it's connected to the troponin. So when calcium binds to troponin and it causes a shape change, it's going to pull the tropomyosin and shift it. And why is that important? Because tropomyosin, remember, at rest, it was lying over on top of that binding site that's on the actin. You just moved it. Now the active site is exposed on actin. Because the binding site on actin is now exposed, that myosin head can bind. When you have a myosin head bind to the actin, that's what we call cross bridge attachment. So the myosin head is going to bind. It's going to cock a little bit and release. And this the whole process is going to require ATP. And you're going to have the sliding filament theory now. You're going to see that. You have the cross bridge. You have that attachment of the myosin head to the actin binding site. 
Why is it happening now? Because now the, the binding site is exposed. Why? Because tropomyosin was pulled off of it. How? Because calcium bound to the troponin. So the sliding filament theory is you get that cross bridge. That's the attachment between myosin and actin. The myosin head is going to cock. It's going to release. And then it's going to bind to the next site. Cock, release, bind. What is this doing? The myosin is pulling the actin or sliding it by each other. So it binds, it's going to slide it, release, bind to the next side, slide, release. Well, if you're sliding these filaments or these strands, thick and thin filaments, closer, what is this? This is actually muscle contraction. The muscle fiber is getting smaller. This continues until you stop that action potential, you stop the release of the calcium. How do you do all this? Well, remember the acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter that bound to that receptor? You need to get it off the receptor to close that ion gate. How do you do that? There's an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase that will break down acetylcholine. When it pulls it off the binding side and breaks it down, that will close the ion gate. As soon as you close the ion gate, that's going to stop the action potential. Once you have stopped the action potential, the calcium is going to return back into storage in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When you pull the calcium off the troponin, that means the tropomyosin, remember binding, but also releasing two things, you get a shape change. So that when you take calcium off the troponin, the tropomyosin goes back to covering that binding site on the actin. And so you have relaxation occurring. <coughs> so once again, in this picture, you have got your action potential that comes down the axon over here on the top picture. You can see by this red arrow here, that's the action potential coming down. These little circles are the vesicles containing the acetylcholine. They are released, the acetylcholine is released, it will diffuse across the synaptic cleft. It will come and it will bind to these receptors, that's what these purple structures are. And when they bind, that's going to open this gate and allow sodium to influx or move into the muscle. So sodium is flowing in, you now generate an action potential, comes around, here's your T-tibial, it moves down here. Here is calcium that's being stored in a terminal cisternine. Because that action potential comes, triggers the release of the calcium, it flows into the sarcoplasma. It's going to combine to the troponin, triggering the tropomyosin to shift, so now see you've got all these exposed binding sites, so now the myosin head can bind. And what's going to happen? The head's going to cock, release. This step here requires ATP, that's why it requires energy for muscle contractions to occur, and you end up with the, the muscle shortening because that's contraction. This will continue until the acetylcholine esterase starts to break down the acetylcholine, which closes these little gates here. You no longer generate an action potential. That's going to trigger calcium to go back into the terminal cisternite of the SR. So now notice here how the trope, when the calcium is pulled off, it's no longer bound to the troponin. The tropomyosin now is covering over those binding sites. This head has no place to bind. It's just going to sit there. It can't do anything. So now what happens? The muscle's going to relax. The sliding filament model contraction just says that the actin are pulled by the myosin. They slide past them during muscle contraction. The binding sites on actin at rest are covered by the tropomyosin. When calcium binds to the troponin, it moves the tropomyosin off. Of that binding site and you get that cross bridging which is the binding. ATP is required for this to occur. So this is showing at rest on top. You don't have any binding 
between the myosin head and the binding site. Why? Because the binding site's covered up by the tropomyosin right here, that orange strand. It physically cannot bind there. It's covered up. But over here, where you have muscle contraction occurring, <coughs> excuse me, you can see the darker green spots here. Those are the binding sites. They're exposed. So the myosin heads can bind to them. And notice how the thick filaments, the positioning of them have stayed the same, but the thin filaments, the active, notice the difference right here. Notice overall the sarcomere has gotten shorter. It's muscle contraction. And this is just another way of showing it once again. Binding sites exposed, you're going to get cross bridge. It's going to cock, the little head cocks up, then it's going to be released, it detaches, and then it resets. And this just keeps going over and over and over. So it binds, forming the cross bridge, head cocks, releases, resets, binds. So you're sliding this along. What are the various sources of ATP? Because ATP is necessary for this to occur. The various sources for ATP can be you do have a small amount of ATP that is just stored. It's just there in the muscle. That's only going to supply a few seconds of energy, though. There's not very much. Another source after that has been depleted is creatine phosphate. Creatine phosphate can be converted, and you can get some ATP from that, but that's only going to provide you about another 15 seconds. After that, you're going to have to go to glycolysis. Glycolysis is the process of breaking glucose down, and it produces pyruvic acid as a byproduct. Now, once you've broken the glucose to pyruvic acid, there are two options. If oxygen is present, then you will go through an aerobic Aerobic process um, continues through cellular respiration. That means aerobic means oxygen is present. So if oxygen is present, then you will take that pyruvic acid and you'll continue through cellular respiration. That is going to be the most efficient way of producing ATP. You will generate a lot of ATP per glucose molecule. If oxygen is not present, then you're going to go the anaerobic route. And what happens there is now that you've got the pyruvic acid, oxygen is not present. So for animals, what you're going to do is what we call acid fermentation, specifically lactic acid fermentation. Some organisms, such as some fungi and bacteria, can carry out alcohol fermentation. And we've learned how to capitalize upon that. But thankfully, we humans, certainly, and other animals cannot carry out alcohol fermentation in our cells. We carry out lactic acid fermentation. So when oxygen is not present, the pyruvic acid will be converted to lactic acid. That will provide a little bit of ATP kind of to keep you going until you can get more oxygen. And if you do any type of exercise, you see this where you start off um, exercising Excuse me. And now it's going to depend if you regularly exercise, you have a higher tolerance for lactic acid, and you're much more efficient about switching back and forth. If you're someone like me who does not exercise regularly, um, if I were to start running, okay, number one, if I were to start running, be concerned because I don't run, there's really a big problem. Um, start running in the same direction I'm going, and at least you'll be ahead of me, so you'll be fine. But if I were to start running, initially, first couple of seconds, I'm going to use up that stored ATP. About the next 15 seconds, I'm going to take the creatine phosphate, convert that to use for ATP, but that's only going to get me about another 15 seconds. So any glucose that I have has got to be converted to pyruvic acid. Now initially, I'm going to use it some, but 
if I start running, I don't have the excess oxygen supply. I'm going to run out basically at the cellular level. I'm going to run out of oxygen really quick. So what will happen is I'll convert to anaerobic to this lactic acid fermentation. I will still be able to produce some ATP. I'm taking the pyruvic acid and I'm, I'm producing lactic acid. The problem with that is because I don't regularly exercise, um, I don't like that lactic acid. Nobody does. I'm not going to tolerate it well. Lactic acid is an acid. It's going to drop the pH, which my body is not going to like, and it's going to let me know. How? Because my muscles are going to start aching. When you get that burning, aching feeling, it's usually due to the lactic acid being produced. Now, as you're exercising, what's one of the things that you do? Your heart rate increases, right? So that you can pump more blood. Why? It's because you want that blood going to your lungs. You're going to increase the rate and the depth of which you're breathing. You're going to breathe heavier and faster. Why? To get more oxygen. And your heart's pumping to get that now oxygenated blood to the muscles so they can get the oxygen and convert back to aerobic. Convert back to cellular respiration so that you can produce the most efficient way of producing ATP. And why do you need the ATP? Because you need it for that muscle contraction to occur. For muscle relaxation, what's going to happen here? Well, the acetylcholine uh, released from the neuron is stopped. Acetylcholine is going to be broken down by acetylcholine esterase. That's going to close those ion gates. Now you've got to restore, remember on the internal part of the cell you had all that sodium coming in and it made it much more positive. You need to restore back to the way it was when the cell was at rest. You have to get it back negative. Your sodium potassium pump is going to help restore that gradient. It is going to help with the repolarization. Repolarization is getting the cell back to that resting state. Sodium potassium pump is going to pump three sodium ions out and two potassium ions in. So you're pumping out more positive than what you're pumping back in. So that's going to help restore to a negative charge. Calcium is going to be put back in storage in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The cross bridging has stopped. The sarcomere is going to return to its original position. Now, this is a link to a video that I made uh, using a whiteboard and colored markers in going through all of these steps. I felt that it uh, might help normally when I teach in face to face. I will do this and start at the beginning and you can follow the action potential coming down. So on your own time you can take the time to click on this link and it will take you to the video where I have muscle contraction. I also at the end uh, have a, a drawing of a graph where I'm showing the resting state, depolarization, repolarization, which is returning back to that negative resting state, and then finally the return to the resting state. So take a time, uh, a chance to, to just view this video. In terms of muscle strength, <coughs> the number of muscle fibers that you have in a particular muscle is determined genetically. Uh, now, the number of the myofibrils, the, the actin and myosin complex, and the number of saccharomeres, that can vary from one individual to another. When you increase the number of the myosin and actin complexes and sarcomeres, that's uh, hypertrophy. It can be due to hormones, stress, artificial chemicals. You increase the mass. Atrophy is the reverse. It's where you're decreasing the mass. Why? Because you're decreasing the number of the myofibrils and the sarcomeres. It's usually due to decreased use of the muscle. Muscle tension is the term that we use referring to the force that's generated by the muscle contraction. You can have an isotonic contraction or you can have an isometric contraction. Isotonic contraction is when the muscle contraction uh, is going to involve a change in the muscle length. Concentric contraction is when the muscle is going to shorten. 
and eccentric contraction is going to be when the muscle uh, length is diminished. So isometric contraction is the muscle contraction um, is occurring, but there's no change in the muscle length. So this is just showing um, isometric down here where there's uh, you don't see a change or the, the movement per se. There's no movement with it, but the muscles contracting, but you don't have any movement here. And then concentric versus eccentric is which way is the movement occurring. Motor units. It's just when a group of muscle fibers are innervated by a single motor neuron. All of those muscle fibers that are innervated by that, that's referred to as a motor unit. Uh, a smaller motor unit helps to um, produce very fine-tuned movements like grasping um, you know, a pencil or something off a tabletop. Heavier or larger movements are going to be controlled by a larger motor unit. Um, so running, lifting heavy weights, something like that. Usually not all the motor units are going to be stimulated at the same time. You get a more efficient response that way. You don't fatigue as quickly that way. In terms of the length and the tension range of a sarcomere, cross bridges are only going to occur where the actin and myosin overlap. That makes sense. If they don't overlap, there's, they can't reach each other to have the cross bridge occur. The length of the sarcomere will determine the amount of force that's then generated. In terms of the frequency of the stimulation of the motor neuron, a twitch is where you have just a single action potential produces a single contraction. Uh, when you look at this, you can graph it out, and there's three different sections that we call periods. There's a latent period. That's when the action potential is generated and you have your calcium being released from the SR. That is going to be followed by the contraction period, which is when the calcium binds now and you get that cross bridging occurring. And then the relaxation period, this is where the contraction stops and the calcium is being uh, returned back to the SR. And like I said, you can graph this out. So that latent period, you don't have muscle contraction yet. Now the contraction period and then the relaxation, returning that calcium back. Now you can see here the length of time that this takes uh, for the, the entire process from where you had that first stimulus is about 100 milliseconds. This is for skeletal muscle, remember. It's going to be a little different with cardiac muscle. A graded muscle response means that you have a series of action potentials that it's providing for the sustained contraction of the muscle. You get more force that way. Wave summation, successive stimuli are added, and so each time it gets a little bit stronger, a little bit stronger, and a little bit stronger for the contraction. And then tetanus refers to where you have a continuous contraction. There's no relaxation period at all between them. So you can see wave summation here. See how each one's getting progressively stronger? You do have a relaxation period. It's not complete, but you do have some relaxation period. Here comes another stimulus in this little bit strong region. Versus tetanus, there is no, you reach this plateau, there is no relaxation period whatsoever. Trap is the tension and the, the muscle contractions increase with successive stimulation. For this, though, you do have to have a nice, good, strong, adequate supply of ATP. Muscle tones referring to where you have this low, low contraction, but you're not producing movement, and you're actually consciously usually not even aware of it. That is necessary for you to help to maintain your posture. When you're sitting up straight, are you aware of the muscles that are contracting in your back? Or in your hips? No, probably not. But you have the one muscle contracts, another, and then it relaxes, another one contracts. They're, they're alternating around. But it's such a low level, you're not getting any movement. And like I say, you may not be consciously aware of it, but it helps to maintain your posture. It's helping to maintain that stability of your joints again. 
abnormally low muscle tone is hypotonia, an example of a disease where you would see this, thankfully, not so much anymore, but it is polio. Unfortunately, polio has not been eradicated, and it is still around. Hypertonia is the reverse. We have high muscle tone. An example of this would be Parkinson's disease. In terms of exercise and muscle performance, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when you have increased uh, exercise, you tend to increase the diameter of the muscles. The muscle mass will increase as opposed to when you are not exercising and you have a decrease in the cell diameter, decrease in muscle mass. Atrophy is certainly a problem. Uh, many of you are going into the healthcare field, and that is something you must be very much aware of with patients who are bedridden for any length of time. You want to get them up and moving so the muscles do not atrophy. Sarcopenia is an age-related type of muscle atrophy. Endurance exercising, when you increase what it's going to happen here. You're going to increase the number of mitochondria. Remember, mitochondria are where you're producing the ATP. So you'd be able to generate more ATP to sustain the muscle contractions. You're going to be increasing the number of myoglobulin. This is a compound that binds oxygen. So you will have a higher concentration of oxygen in those muscle cells. And actually also increase the number of capillaries. All of this is occurring in fibers that are known as your SO or slow oxidative uh, fibers. If you increase this in the slow oxidative fibers, it allows someone to be able to participate in some of these endurance exercise activities. Because what happens is then the muscle is very slow to fatigue. Do you have a real strong, powerful contractions? No, it's kind of like slow and steady goes away. It's it's lower power contractions, but you're able to sustain and, and keep it sustained over long periods of time. It's sort of like um, anyone who knows me knows that I, I certainly don't go running because I have bad knees, but uh, and I, I do not exercise regularly. However, for many years I participated uh, yearly in the Relay for Life where we would start on a Friday evening and we would walk all night long around the track until sunrise Saturday morning. And so it was one of those things, don't ask me to lift weights with my legs where I have to have a lot of power but for a short period of time. But can I walk? I could walk all night long. It didn't require strong contractions. And so just walking, that was fine. Don't ask me to run, but I could I could walk all night long. Resistance uh, exercise, this can actually uh, cause a result in hypertrophy because you are using excessive um, uh, use of the muscles, so they respond by the muscle mass increasing. Tends to involve a high number of your fast glycolytic fibers now, your FG fibers. They tend to use anaerobic metabolism to produce very powerful, strong contractions. The catch is it cannot sustain it very long, so they will fatigue very quickly. So like someone who's able to lift a huge uh, amount of weights, you know, they can pick up several hundred pounds of weight. Can they hold it for a long time? No, they pick it up and then immediately put it down. All of that was with the skeletal muscle, but remember there's two other types of muscle. There's cardiac muscle and there's smooth muscle. Cardiac muscle is found only in the heart. It is striated. It has a single nucleus per cell. It does tend to have a lot of branching with it. It does contain those intercalated discs that we mentioned earlier that help to connect adjacent cells together. It's going to allow the cardiac muscle to contract much more efficiently, which is what you want in the heart, which is muscle. You want it, the heart to pump as a single unit. You want all those cells pumping at the same time. Pacemaker cells are the specialized cells that will control the rate of the, the heart beating, the rate of the contractions. There are some other things that can influence it, like hormones, but overall, um, it's these pacemaker cells that control the heart rate. 
This diagram is showing uh, a slide of cardiac muscle. It's a little hard to tell on here, uh, but there are striations on here, and then there are some intercalated discs right here. You can see that, that line that extends. It, it's right here. That is an intercalated disc. And cardiac muscle, remember, is found only in the heart. Smooth muscle is going to be found in the walls of your hollow organs, like your stomach, walls of passageways, like along the intestines, your eyes, helping the, like the iris to make the pupil smaller. And in the skin, you have a smooth muscle in the skin, the uh, erector pili muscle, that when it contracts, you get goosebumps. Smooth muscle, spindle shaped. It does have a single nucleus per cell. There's no striations. You do not have sarcomeres there. Smooth muscle does not have troponin. Instead, it has a chemical known as calmodin, as a regulatory protein. That's what the calcium is going to bind to. So calcium in skeletal muscle binds to the troponin, but in smooth muscles, it will, uh, instead, it will bind to the calmodulin. Varicosity, this contains the neurotransmitters. It kind of wraps around the smooth muscles, these little swellings, and it will release it into the synaptic club. So that's another difference. The stimulus, the first smooth muscle to contract, it will be neural. It can also be hormonal, and it can also be local factors like stretching. This is showing what smooth muscle looks like. Notice there are no striations at all. In smooth muscle, when you have uh, the relaxed muscle cells, you can see here, you've got these filaments. That are, um, it kind of looks like a net that's placed over the muscle. And you have these little dense bodies that's helping to hold everything together. And then when it contracts, it, it's like it coils up. You can see that it is different than the skeletal muscle. And then the varicosities, like I said, you've got these strands. These are these little, they look like little bubbles, these little swellings. That's where the neurotransmitter is that's going to be released.